On Law Weekly today, we talk issues of judicial appointment by the president and what lessons the bar and the bench can learn from the COVID-19 pandemic. We have the views of a senior advocate of Nigeria, Titilola Akinlawo. Staying with the rising incidents of rape in Nigeria, we get another legal practitioner, Onyeka Chiuma, to talk to us about what our law says about the offense of rape and the punishment. Plus our weekly recap of the stories from the courts. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shola Sheely. My guest, Titilala Akinlao, was called to the bar in 1981. She obtained her LLM from the University of Lagos in 1983 and was elevated to the rank of a senior advocate in 2010. A specialist in litigation, Mrs. Akinlao has handled matters in various areas of labor law, international law, family law, to mention a few. With the recent swearing-in of Justice Monica Dongma Mason as President of the Court of Appeal, I began by asking our opinion on the handling of judicial appointments by President Mohamed Buhari, especially the seeming refusal to fill vacancies at the Supreme Court and the implications of this on the administration of justice in the country. It's the President's prerogative. The Constitution gave that power to the President based on the recommendation of the NJC. Once the NJC has done the recommendation, it, it rests on the president to take the recommendation or not take the recommendation. That is why it's simply a recommendation. So he will have to take his time if he wants to take his time. And um, we've seen how it has been. Everything had been running on a slow lane. In, it's not only the judicial sector. Every aspect of Nigeria has been on a slow lane. So that is the style of the president. But the bottom line is that the courts have come up with a method of how judges should be appointed. They do it in order of seniority so that there will be no rancor of any kind. The Supreme Court, being the last court, is inundated with too many cases. Today, if an appeal is entered in the Supreme Court today, 2020. The, going by the trend of what we have now, the earliest time that case can be taken will be 2033. Wow. Minimum of 13 years. I've had cases f entered into 2007, 2009 that have not even seen the light of day. They what's causing the delay? There are too many cases. And, okay, like, for instance, in my office, we had two cases listed for hearing after so long. But when it was time for them to be heard, the courts cannot take those cases because they were attending to election petition cases. Mm. And the bar is arguing that we should at least inject fresh blood Look outside, into, yes. into the Supreme Court, get people from the bar, get people from the academia to come into, to inject fresh blood into it. But it's been, it, 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 that, that position is not well taken by the judiciary because they feel that why should they come and incurs into our territory when they are on another lane entirely. And it's really affecting the quality of the judgments we are having. Most of our judgments, there's no substantive law being determined. Everything seems to be procedural. We need landmark cases. We need precise position of the courts on substantive law. Let us develop our laws and everything. But now, just to me, it appears as if everything we do there is, <laughs> okay, let's just do it, you know. But I, I think the, the president, maybe the vice president being a lawyer himself, should understand the problem and bring it to the fore to enable the judicial system to be what it should be. In, in, in all ramifications. I'm glad that you talked about the vice president. Some other people too, rightly or wrongly, have also blamed the attorney general. He advises the president. How much of the blame do you think he should take for this delay that we are seeing in the appointment? Well, I don't know. I don't know a lot about politics. I only know, know law. I know that in every circumstance, politics is what we are seeing here. That is what is playing out. Because I know that the bar... Uh, advocating that, look, this time we must have other people coming in and the judiciary wrestling is not going to happen. And even because the CJN had made public pronouncement relating to that. And in that, in that regard, how 
what, what can the Attorney General do? What can the Attorney General do? Don't forget that the CJN is the, is the chairman of the Judicial Council, National Judicial, Judicial Council, Council, that will make recommendation to the president. So look, we, we, we're just in a quandary. We're just going round and round in circles. So unless and until the, we have fundamental changes, we really, it's not very likely we will go far relating to this question of getting people appointed to the Supreme Court. But, but, but you think that there is merit in, in that argument that lawyers from the bar uh, should go to absolutely. the bench? Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, if we go back to history, the people that came from the bar, they did wonderfully well in the Supreme Court. Let's talk about COVID-19 and some of the issues that come with it. Despite the lockdown, despite the global pandemic, we still have um, disputes which necessitate a recourse to the courts. And some people have made the argument that law, legal services, the court should be essential services and that the court should remain open and work full steam. Do you think that there is any merit in that argument? Oh, certainly. If you go to visit the police stations now, you see it filled to the brim. There was a day I went to Panty. There was no space to put people. They had to lock them in Danfo in front of the station. So, <laughs> certainly, in, in other climes, legal services are considered to be essential. Even in Africa, it's considered to be essential. So why would Nigeria be different? And particularly because of the lockdown, it created so many social problems that the courts must quickly intervene. So we have to, we have to find a way to get the courts to be on in full steam. Yes, the courts are coming up, although the practice direction said you cannot take trials. It's only cases where have judgment, final address, or affidavit evidence will be required. So in a situation where there is an urgent matter that you require to take evidence in court, we, we will not be able to do it. So that's why people are advocating for virtual hearing, mm. maybe. If we get to virtual hearing, we may be able to make sure that the steam of justice continues to rule. We'll come to virtual hearings, but I want to stick with the issue of um, legal services being considered essential services. Clearly it is. So Clearly. Is, is it safe to open the courts fully? Well, there are protocols. The N NCDC has issued protocols that everybody must follow. Even my little office, we have to follow the protocol. You use a thermometer, you wash your hands, you use hand sanitizer. So you think once all that is done, the courts should open fully? Well, yes. And then they restrict the number of people that will come into court to maintain social distancing. If your case is not on, you cannot enter the courtroom. I saw people sitting outside the courtroom today even despite the rains because it wasn't their turn to come into the courtroom so we there's a there's a way we can walk around this let's come now to the issue of virtual or remote court hearings there have been arguments for and against <laughs> um some lawyers saying that some lawyers saying that the laws that we have in place now accommodate virtual court hearings mm -hmm. some lawyers say no we need to go back to the constitution so much so that even the law lawmakers are trying to amend it and some people say if you do that then all that we've done would be rendered uh, null and void. That so, with the laws we have are, are, are adequate. There's no need to amend. Hmm. Where do you stand on this argument? Well, personally, I believe that the constitution provides that court proceedings and delivery of judgment must be in public. The question is, what constitutes, constitutes public? public? The argument, yes, is germane that, well, once you give out the link, anybody can come in into the... the More than a courtroom can even accommodate. accommodate. That's yeah. the argument I've heard so many times. But personally, I would not go on with virtual court proceedings because I've been, I've been, hurt, I've been caught in the issue of what is considered to be public. I had a matter that emanated from the High Court in 2000, year 2000. 20 and years ago. Tw that, and got to the Supreme Court late last year. And the Supreme Court set aside the judgment of the Court of Act, I mean the High Court, simply by the fact that the judgment was delivered in the judge's chambers. Even though the judge wrote that this was the third day that he was unable to deliver the judgment because there was caught in the pu public power supply and, and the courts, the way it is in the legal cycle, you cannot see at all. So he was compelled to deliver this judgment in chambers. And we argued that because... 
and lawyers had access to the chambers? That's the thing. The, the parties were all in the chambers. And the doors were open, the windows were open. Because there was even no light anyway. So you had to open the windows and you had to open the door. And our argument was that, look, the fact that, yes, naturally, the judges' chambers was not a public place. But for that purpose, it should be considered as public. Because the doors were left open. There was no light and we were so many. So the, for even for ventilation, we needed the door to be opened and everything. But the, the Supreme Court said, no. So you can imagine 20 years of work gone down the drain just because of the interpretation the Supreme Court had placed on the meaning of public. So I would not participate in any proceedings, virtual proceedings, without the amendment of the Constitution to reflect that public can include internet access and what have you, or what howsoever they would want to eat amended. But because looking at the state of the law, well, I'm eagerly waiting to hear what the Supreme Court will say on the legal state matter. That has gone before them. All the, all the judgments that they have given have been very restrictive of the meaning of public. So um, we'll we see what they say. Until they say so, I would not, I would not take any virtual hearing. I so if not. you get a date from the court that your matter is going to go I'm on? Going to, I'm going to raise an objection. So the court can rule, then we can continue to go on appeal on that. It's better to do that. Look at it now. I, it, my, the case I was talking about, the land case, most of the witnesses are dead. Where do you start from? And look, if you, ah, I don't even want to imagine going, starting afresh again. I mean, it's, you, I cannot. Once beaten, twice shy. 20 years down the drain, I'm not ready to try it again. <laughs> because anybody that who doesn't have anything to do, if you really don't have any substantive case and you just want to use technicality, that's the first thing you do. I mean, that was why we went to the Supreme Court. Even in that appeal, they didn't raise any substantive thing. It was just that judgment was delivered in chambers. It was unconstitutional. Set it aside. And they did. Finally, I know you must be worried about the rising cases of sexual violence, rape cases, defilement that we've seen on the increase now. Some people say it's as a result of the pandemic. Some people say it was there before the pandemic, but there, now there's increase in reporting. But do you think that our laws are adequate to cater for the victim? Do we have enough laws to, to help the victim? Well, hmm. that's a tough one. Because, because, because more worrisome is the fact that even though there are so many cases, the rate of conviction is not the same. It's not, it's not even only the rate of conviction, I would say. It's not only the rate of conviction. Even when the conviction comes, what, what punishment is meted out to the, to the accused person? The law stipulates life imprisonment. Then you find judges... Grants, I mean, given three years imprisonment. Why do they do that? Well, it's a society. It's, it's the male chauvinism. What is rape? Do you understand? Going back, going back, you would see that the, the attitude of the courts, I believe, is what had encouraged rape. If five, six, ten people had been sentenced to life with hard labor, uh, the other person would think twice. But when you give three, three years imprisonment and you give seven years imprisonment, it's like you're just tapping their hand. Don't do slap it on the wrist, yes. Yeah, that's it. We're just, we're, just, we're just joking. If the proper punishment is imposed, I guess that it should be a deterrent. Although sociologists will tell us that that really does not deter, punishment does not deter people because everybody always believes that if I do it, I will get away with it. So it may not be, but at least it will make the victim feel a bit better that, okay, you are caught, you have to do life. I, but personally, I could see that there have been argument people saying it should be death and what, there was one I read on the social media, a three-month-old baby that was raped. I said, look, that's man. For me, it should just be castrated. And the way the House of Rep turned that down with a wave of the hand um, made me to feel that 
because it's a male-oriented society, it doesn't concern them. Welcome back. Now I'm sticking with issues of rape with my next guest, Onye Kachiuma, who is widely regarded in legal circles as a legal awareness expert. He's the founder of a free law awareness platform, LearnNigeriaLaws.com, which promotes the understanding of rights and laws of the country, usually through free daily law tips published in several online platforms. He talks to Law Weekly on what our law says about the offense of rape and the punishment. Uh, we have, when it comes to rape, when you look at what the penal code says, the penal code is the criminal law that is operational in the northern part of Nigeria. Then you also look at the criminal code, which is operational in the southern part of Nigeria. Then you look at case laws. Case laws now will be judgment from courts, we'd say more especially from the court of appeal. Now, cumulatively, these three sources of laws, when it comes to rape, defines rape to be the, the, the sexual intercourse, penetration of the male organ into the female uh, reproductive organ without consent of the female. And even where there is consent, the consent was gotten by force or deceit. Then the parties involved here, that's the rapist and the victim, not being married, that's not being husbands and uh, wives, as it, as it is. Now, that is what makes up rape. Now, this was up until 2015. Since 2015, this definition has changed. Why? Because we have the law, a federal legislation we call the, the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act of 2015. That particular piece of legislation makes it that rape is now the penetration of any opening in any person's body part with anything whatsoever. So if you look at the constant where there is any, 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 all I watch what we had under the criminal code and the penal code and the judgments of the Supreme Court and courts in Nigeria. Now, under the Violence Against Persons Act of 2015, it is now any. That any there, the first any you'll find out is any person. So if a husband rapes a wife, at that point, it becomes rape as opposed to what the criminal code and uh, the penal code limited it to be uh, earlier before 2015. Now, the, before 2015, for it to prove rape, the definition wise, you need just the slightest penetration to prove it. But the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act has made it that even any penetration into the mouth or anus or any opening, if by any chance, you can even put the nose and the ears, anything whatsoever like that. Now, other argument, we have cases where maybe by the definition, people, uh, issues of maybe certain finger or in certain object were heard not to be raped. But by, by the Violence Against Persons Act, such things are now rape. The punishment under the criminal code is life imprisonment, with or without uh, fine. You now go to the penal code. The penal code also said life imprisonment or lesser time. Now, that's why I have problem with that law. Because in, uh, in sentencing, a judge has found Mr. A guilty of rape. He now wants to convict him, convict him wants to now sentence him, say, to XYZ period of uh, imprisonment. The, the judge must be mindful of the, cap, the, the maximum time period for that offense. And when you have life imprisonment, it means that that is the highest you can have. Now, that means you can give, you see cases where maybe a judge may put the person away for, say, uh, seven years, not life imprisonment. Now, to change that scenario, where judges had a lot of uh, discretion to give anything not above life imprisonment. That's where we have the Violence Against Persons 
uh, Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act. By that particular act, the maximum is life imprisonment and the minimum is 12 years. So whatever the judge does, he cannot give you for rape less than 12 years. That's awesome. You know, because the, my argument has been, if you keep making laws and you set only the maximum without setting a minimum, that means that the court has a discretion to go even to give a day imprisonment. You can you can't question him for that. But when you when you set a minimum of twelve years, that means for any case of rape, the least the person can get under can get under that violence against persons are, is that twelve years in prison, and that is very commendable. Now, I'm sure you learned a thing or two from that, but just before we wrap up the program, let's give you a recap of some of the top legal stories in the news. Hi, we'll begin with a report that the Chief Justice of Nigeria, Ibrahim Muhammad, on Friday swore in Justice Monica Dungban Mentum as a substantive president of the Court of Appeal. The swearing in ceremony was held at the Supreme Court complex in Abuja, the Federal Capital Territory, and witnessed by family, friends, and colleagues of the new Court of Appeal president. SCGN used the opportunity of the swearing-in to encourage Justice Dunga Mentum to maintain the credibility and integrity of the appellate court, which he described as a court with the largest number of justices in the country. The new Court of Appeal president expressed joy over her confirmation as the second female president of the court. She assured Nigerians that she will do her best in ensuring that justice is served at the appellate court while promising to build on the legacy left behind by her predecessors. Staying with the Court of Appeal, a three-man panel of the court has affirmed the suspension of Comrade Adams Ashamale as a member of the party and national chairman of the All Progressives Congress. Ruling on an interlocutory appeal filed by Comrade Ashamale, the appellate court upheld the decision of the Federal Capital Territory High Court delivered by Justice Dan Lamy Senchi, which in March ordered the suspension of Ashamale as well as restraining him from parading himself as a national chairman of the party. In a unanimous judgment, the court held that the FCT High Court had territorial jurisdiction to have entertained the suit as it did. The court also withdrew his rights and privileges as national chairman of the party, including his security details. Staying in Abuja, a federal high court has extended the interim order restraining Governor Godwin Obasaki from arresting the suspended national chairman of the All Progressives Congress, APC, Comrade Adams Ashamale, over his alleged indictment by a panel of inquiry. At the resumed hearing of the suit, Justice Ahmed Mohamed ordered all parties involved in the matter to stay action till June 29 when the court will hear a motion challenging his jurisdiction to entertain the application Comrade Shomole filed for the protection of his fundamental human right. Apart from Governor Obasaki, the other respondents in the matter are Edo State Government, the Attorney General and Commissioner of Justice, Edo State, Chairman of the Panel of Inquiry, Justice J. Oyomire, the Inspector General of Police and the Department of State Service. The court had in the ruling on June 1, 2020, restrained both Governor Obasaki and other respondents from taking any steps to arrest Comrade Oshomale, who is a former governor of the state, over the report of the Justice Oyomire panel that indicted him for corruption and diversion of public funds. Another federal high court has renewed the order empowering Mr. Victor Giadum to act as the national chairman of the All Progressives Congress for two weeks. The court, presided over by Justice Sule Bature, also empowered Comrade Mustafa Salihu, the APC National Vice Chairman Northeast, to act as the National Secretary. Mr. Victor Giadom had earlier insisted that he is the authentic acting National Chairman of the APC, following a ruling of the Federal Capital Territory High Court. Giadom, who is the party's Deputy National Secretary, says he is the highest-ranking official following the ruling of the Court of Appeal, which upheld Comrade Adams of Shamala's suspension and declared all his actions since his suspension null and void. The APC National Public Secretary, Lanre Issa Onilu, had announced Senator Abiola Jimobi as the acting national chairman, being the deputy national chairman, South. And we round off with a report that the judgment in the suit filed by the former senator representing Kogi West, Senator Dino Milai, who is challenging the decision of the House of Representatives to deliberate on the infectious disease bill currently before the House, has been fixed for the 30th of June 2020. At the proceedings, Lord Senator Malai adopted his final address, where he claimed that some of the sections of the proposed bill are injurious and capable of affecting the fundamental rights of his client. Lawyers to the House of Representatives, the Attorney General of the Federation and the Inspector General of Police, however, challenged the competency of the suit and the jurisdiction of the court to entertain it, as they insist that the House of Representatives are only performing their legislative duties. Justice Ijoma Ojuku, after listening to all the parties, fixed the 30th of June 2020 for judgment. And this is where we are joined till next week. Don't forget that you can find this episode of the program and past episodes 
on our YouTube channel. After viewing, be sure to leave us a feedback. I'm Shola Sheely. Thank you for watching.